what happens, this is automatic transmission, sort of a pretest. let will see where you are. Uh, what happens when a holding clutch is applied? You're basically, the heart of every automatic transmission out there that's not, you know, chain driven continuous variable or whatever, is a planetary gear set. You guys understand a planetary gear set? You know what I mean? You got a sun gear, you got planet gears, and you got ring in the simplest uh, form of it. Yeah, basically, if you you can hold or you can drive any three parts of it. you've got the the sun gear can be held or driven, the planet carrier can be held and driven, or the ring gear can be held and driven, and that's giving you all your gears. And some of them there's compound planetary gear sets and all that stuff. But the long and the short of it is. Your clutches and your holding components are basically there for the purpose of holding or driving certain parts of the planetary gear set, and that's what gives you your different gears in a standard automatic transmission. You know, just the place, basically the heart of it is the planetary gear set. And in the valve body, you've got spool valves that are moving around, diverting the oil flow to various different uh, clutches and components and all that. And you've got servos that actually operate. Sometimes, I don't know if you, when you get turn into transmissions, you're going to see some that you'll have the the plates actually are stacked in there in such a way so that you've got uh, outer uh, cogs that are cogged into the case if it's a holding uh, clutch pack, and then the inner cogs will be closed into a component. So basically, then you've got drums where you've got it, the outer and the inner, as long as the, the clutches and those things aren't pinched together by the hydraulic pressure in the piston, then these things spin like separate components. You can get, you'll get to where you're deeper into this as we tear them down, you'll see how that's supposed to work. Uh, but the hydraulic clutches and bands do what? That Actually, the answer to number one is C, a gear set element is held and power flow is redirected. That's basically what that's about. Uh, okay, so now then you got, um, what do the hydraulic clutches and bands do? Yeah, the, the band is a brake, basically. It's stopping something and the clutches actually are transmitting power. Uh, and this is once again through the planetary gear set. Transmission fluid pump is usually driven by what? Torque converter hub or pump input shaft. Uh, okay, number what happens when fluid passes through a reduced opening? Increases. You can imagine what happens whenever you put your thumb over the end of your water hose, water, water hose gets tight, you know? Okay, uh, in a one to one gear ratio, the drive gear rotates what? At the same speed. What is transmission fluid? Why does transmission fluid transfer movement? cannot be compressed. It also works really good for oil in your machine gun. Okay. All right, let's see. Uh, is it a, let's see, what is the role of the hydraulic valve? Uh, actually directs fluid flow or controls pressure. Uh, basically, you've got a pressure control valve in the uh, automatic transmission. Uh, the, the newer ones are basically are going to have a variable force solenoid operating to give you your different, I mean, electronically control the pressure. Uh, and what is the output from one to four gear ratio called? Overdrive. Now, that's an overdrive thing. Basically, what does that mean? That means the drive shaft is spinning faster than the engine. Yeah, and on that one, it's uh, there. You don't hardly ever see that, but they're trying to. They went to the extreme, so you you know get a notion. Uh, clutches and bands are applied and released by what? The valve body. What do the driving devices do? Transfer power. Which of the following is a symptom of the bad fluid pump? Again. Number nine is basically going to be your hydraulic valve body. That's with all those spool valves, and it looks like a maze when you pull it apart, you know. Okay, you got a, which of these is a symptom of a faulty transmission fluid pump? No engagement in any gear. No engagement in any gear. Number 12, what's a symptom of a worn friction discs and a holding clutch? It slips. It slips in the controlled gear, that's right. Uh, and I tell you what, there's not a lot of lining on those things. If it slips just a little bit, it burns them out. Here's something else. Let me stop and say this. If the engine controller is controlling the transmission fluid pressure and the shift points and all that based on what it gets from the vehicle speed sensor for speed and everything, uh, older transmissions had a governor that was basically a mechanically, you know, the, on the hook to the output. and the, Like on that, when you're working on that Cadillac out there, it's got a governor. The faster it spins, the more the flyweights move and it moves the valve and it changes pressure and it causes it to shift up the next gear. Well, on the ones that are... Uh, like, for instance, if the engine controller is watching the uh, output shaft speed and the input shaft speed and it knows it's trying to slip, it actually raises the pressure all the way to the top so that whenever it engages, it just jerks your head off. 
and you know you'll have a usually a flashing overdrive light or something like that and when it jacks that pressure up through the ceiling it's preventing itself from burning those clutches out you know what i mean it feels like it'll tear something up because it's going bam it hits so hard and then people say man this thing shifts really hard you know and you may even clear the trouble code and it may shift normally until it starts to detect that again you know um, the torque converters clutch uh, nowadays instead of being a solid lockup from the engine all the way through actually can be a control slip like 20 30 40 50 percent slippage that's why it's got to have friction modifiers in the oil so that it whenever it slips it won't slip chattering you know like that and uh so what i want you to do now is i want you to take this and screw the top of it and smell it and pass it around the classroom okay that's friction modifier you need to know what that smells like okay and you're really going to love the smell of it i'm telling you it's great okay yeah, that's, that's usually what they say before they wake up the next morning yeah. Put the lid back on it, don't spill it. My buddy over there used to soak a bunch of that into a rag and put it under his buddy's toolbox. And so he just, just, it stinks, doesn't it? You're going to smell transmission fluid that has that smell to it. And yeah, that's basically friction modifier, like what we put in the rear ends on uh, closet track rear ends. That sounds like a mosquito bug decides to go by my house one afternoon. Yeah, the bug truck, yeah, okay. All right, so uh, the, what, what happens inside the torque converter at higher speeds? The turbine and the impeller spin at similar speeds. Okay, if you look at the, you all looked at the front, you got it, you've seen an automatic transmission with the torque converter pulled out, right? Okay, you see splines on the end of a shaft, right? And then right around that, there's another thing that looks like a shaft with splines on it, right? In other words, you're going to see two sets of splines there, a bigger set and a little set. That bigger set of splines behind the initial set that you see, that's the stator support. It doesn't turn, it just sits there. And it's actually the stator slides onto that, the center of the stator, and it's got a one-way clutch in it, the stator does. That's inside the torque converter. The other shaft is the turbine shaft, and that's the shaft by which transmission uh, the, it gets its power from the torque converter. The, whenever you're in lockup, that turbine shaft is spinning the same speed as the engine. You got me? And so it's actually hooked to some components down in there and stuff's going on down there. I mean, it's tra automatic transmissions until you sort of get your head wrapped around how they work are sort of mysterious and crazy. Um, okay, uh, the torque converter is best described as what? It's a fluid coupling that transmits power flow from the engine. If I put two fans over here, I put one fan that's plugged into the wall and another fan that was not plugged into anything, and I turn on the fan that's facing the other fan, what's the other fan going to do? It's going to start turning. And if I've got a shaft that's hooked to that fan, it'll actually do some work. But you don't actually have a direct hookup. You've basically got the medium of the air, which acts like the fluid. And so if you tighten this thing up and give them more, uh, basically more blades and all that, the hull of this torque converter has got an impeller built into it. And I'm gonna, I got one cut apart over here and we'll show you in a minute. And basically as that engine spins that thing, it's gonna throw that fluid against the turbine blades and it's gonna start that turbine trying to turn. And the faster you spin it, the more force it's got and it'll start turning that turbine shaft is going into the transmission and you'll start, going, you'll start moving if you actually have you know, clutches applied and stuff going out there. Okay, so the long and the short of it is in between the turbine and the impeller is a little thing that's on a one, mounted on a one-leg clutch called a stator. And when that fluid circles around and comes back through that part in the middle, it's basically redirecting the fluid so when it hits those turbine blades again, it'll hit them with a maximum amount of force. That gives you torque multiplication. If the one-way clutch is bad in that thing, your stall speed will be low. Does everybody know what stall speed is? Stall speed is when you lock the park brake, you block the wheels, you hold the brake as hard as you can, you put it in gear in your floorboard and accelerator. That's where the RPM stops. It's kind of like you use it for a dyno. If your engine's underpowered, your stall speed will be low, but if your engine's not underpowered and stall speed's low, it means your torque converter's bad because of the one-way clutch on the stator. That's a, it's a real quick thing I'm just telling you right there. Okay, so let's see. How would you describe the torque and speed produced by a one to four gear ratio? High speed, low torque. Hydraulic pistons used to operate what? Most hydraulic apply devices. Now, what do holding devices do? I think they hold stuff. <laughs> they prevent gear elements from turning. I'm trying to get through this here really quick here. What happens when fluid passes through an enlarged opening? Pressure decreases. Pressure decreases. The transmission fluid pump outlet port leads to what? Torque converter. Torque converter. Transaxle is different from a transmission because the transaxle does what? 
uses half shaft. It does have a, it has to have a torque converter. Look at the Cadillac, you know, he had a torque converter on that one. Uh, out of transmissions and transaxles produce the range of torque needed for normal driving. Different gear combinations. Like for instance, how do you get reverse out of a planetary gear set? Think about it. You're going to hold the carrier, which means that the, the, uh, all the little planetary gear is going to do is idle, and then you're going to turn the sun gear, and that's going to drive the, the carrier, I mean the uh, ring gear backwards, because if those gears in the middle, see? Uh, what kind of transmission fluid pump uses a hub with retractable veins that slide along the inside of a movable bore ring? See. That's actually a variable displacement vein pump. You can figure that out if you look at the word vein. Okay, uh, which of these is a pressure control valve? Spring-loaded spring spool valve. And in one, one to four gear ratio, the drive gear rotates slower than the gear it drives. What does a planetary gear set do? Various output ranges of torque and speed. That didn't take very long. Was that very, how many, who failed it? No, I was wondering what number 10 was again. What, what? Number 10. Number 10? That's first power. Okay. All right. Now then. All right. Now then, you, you guys see this uh, transmission pressure test and pop test? That is something you need to hang on to and probably put on your clipboard permanently as long as you're uh, interested in automatic transmissions at all. Um, automatic transmissions are, um, you know, fairly complicated, but I mean, I rebuilt uh, quite a few of them before I even understood how they worked. <laughs> that was interesting how you could take that thing apart and look at all the parts and rattle them back together and it'd work, you know? I mean, I, you know, I knew how to take them stuff put it back. I did with manual transmissions too for six years. You know, I didn't go to school anywhere. I just worked. You know, my dad opened a shop in 1960. Never having worked on cars before, he just started working on cars. Uh, but in those days, you could do that. Nowadays, you can't because there's too much going on. Uh, how will the pressures look on a transmission with a stuck pressure regulator valve? Anybody know? Uh, it's going to show up as fixed line pressure, which means the same pressure all the time. Now, I've got a transmission pressure gauge connected to this Ranger out here, and I want everybody to see what it does. And uh, i tell you something else that would be a good idea, if we can make this happen. I don't have enough gauges for everybody to do it at the same time. Hook a pressure gauge up to the pressure, line pressure test port on your vehicle and drive it for about a week, and just watch that gauge. I don't know if I can do that. Yeah, on your motorcycle it might be hard. <laughs> but basically, if you get used to what that gauge is doing, Whenever things are right, then you'll know whenever things aren't right. Got me? All right. So, okay. So, if a transmission has normal pressure in park, reverse, and neutral, but has low pressure in all forward ranges, what's the probable cause of that? Pressure in An internal leak somewhere. Think about it. Okay. Huh? Uh, it, yeah. It's going to just fix land pressure on that. Okay. When doing a stall test, what precautions should be taken? Uh, wheels, uh, bridge. You better lock that thing up. Make sure that uh, you don't look for look for broken mounts too. If you got broken motor mounts or if you got weak motor mounts, you can break a motor mount doing a stall test. But a stall test is something that's in the book. It's one of the things when you're checking automatic transmissions to make sure they're working okay. You're supposed to do a stall test so that you can get a notion of what's going on. That's part of your diagnostic stuff that the data you're gathering. Uh, right there. Okay. In which ranges should main line pressure be checked? Each range except park or neutral. You're not going to do a, st and your line pressure check is going to be um, tested in reverse, drive, and then your D1 and D2, if, I mean, whatever those ranges are. But obviously, you can't do a stall test in park or neutral because you just be, you know, tacking the engine out for no reason. All right, number five. When checking main line pressure under what three operating conditions should the pressure be checked? Slow idle, fast idle, and wide open throttle. Now, wide open throttle is with your foot. Now, if you're if you're trying to do that uh, line pressure test, the park brake don't work, and you can't stand hard enough on a brake, uh, you're not gaining anything by doing a burnout there in the shop. Okay, yes. so I mean, just don't go there. Is you're actually supposed to have it where it will uh, do that. I mean, where it'll hold everything solid where you're checking it. You said, and once again, huh? You said slow idle, fast idle. Slow idle, fast idle, and wide open throttle. Think what? Okay, number what? Uh, if pressures are high at slow idle, it indicates what? Okay, what if pressures are high at slow idle? We got a pressure regulator or a throttle pressure problem. Now, throttle pressure, let me explain this right here. Um, your transmission, whenever you just take off with your foot lightly on the throttle, 
uh, your shift points are lower, aren't they? It's going to shift from first to second at a fairly low speed. It's going to shift from second to third at a fairly low speed. And it's going to shift from, you know, on up to the fourth if it's a four speed. And it, uh, when it hits third, if it's got a lock up torque converter, it's pretty much when the torque converter is going to lock up. You know I mean? And then in fourth, it'll lock up. It'll stay locked up because that's going to be your overdrive range. And they're doing it for gas mileage. Okay, so here you are. If you get heavy into the throttle, it's going to hold the gears longer, isn't it? Because it needs to. Uh, who in here drives a stick? Or knows how to drive one? I do. If you're really wanting to get on it, you're going to hold that thing in gear longer, and then you're going to, Don't you know. Don't listen to him. He has a bike. It's already Yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, if you're holding that, if you're holding that thing up, an automatic transmission is going to do the same thing. It wants to get the maximum amount of speed that it can out of that gear before it goes to the next one. And so, how are you going to make the automatic transmission do that? There's a couple of ways to do it. One, you might notice there's a vacuum line on that vacuum modulator on that Cadillac out there, and on that Oldsmobile, that uh, '97 Oldsmobile we got, it's got a vacuum modulator on it. And uh, even though it's got solenoids in the transmission, it's still got a vacuum modulator. And so basically, low vacuum means high engine load. High engine load means hold the gears longer, right? That ain't complicated, is it? Well, Chrysler never used a modulator rail as far as I've ever seen. They always had a throttle valve that was connected there. And instead of using a modulator valve that was measured engine vacuum, they measured throttle position. So the deeper into your throttle you were, you would have uh, basically governor pressure and you know throttle valve pressure fighting each other. So governor pressure says, I want to shift to the next gear. And throttle valve pressure says, no, you don't. Not until I'm saying this. You know, and these, some of these cars have got what they call fuzzy logic. You know, have you ever set your cruise control and you didn't want to hear it? You didn't want it to downshift going up a hill? You know what I mean? Set your cruise control. It starts up a hill. All of a sudden, wah, wah. Say, well, I'm, you know, that stinks, you know. You're going to do better from gas mileage not using your cruise control on hills. But anyway, so the, they had fuzzy logic on some of these uh, Mitsubishi slash Chrysler cars back in the late 90s. And what they would do is they'd, they'd have the, in, the electronics would say, look, uh, look, trans, transaxle computer, I know you would ordinarily shift to the next gear at this throttle angle and load, but because this person's got their cruise control set, let's not do that this time, okay? And they would say, okay, so that's what fuzzy logic was all about. It's pretty interesting how that kind of thing worked. Uh, but anyway, we're looking at uh, a restricted filter will show up as what? A gradual pressure drop at higher engine RPM. Got it? So as you think about it, as you come up with your RPM and it's wanting more fluid than it can get because the filter is clogged, you're going to see pressure drop, uh, drop off. If all pressures at stall are low, what should you do? Pull the throttle valve cable, if it has a throttle valve cable, to the maximum or disconnect the modulator vacuum line to see if the pressure is normalized. Okay. Yeah. The throttle valve cable is the cable that's basically going to tell the, you know, move the valve inside the transmission so that it will hold the gears longer. It raises the pressure. So you're going to raise the pressure and make it, you know, the pressure is actually is going to, when the pressure is delivered to various places based on the governor of the throttle valve, that's what's going to determine when it shifts. And if you've got low pressures across the board, Pull on your throttle valve cable and you know, make it think it's applying the throttle, and that'll cause the pressures to go up. You got me? All right. If you uh, unplug the back wow. vacuum modulator valve, what's it? What's it do? If let's say you f you're driving the Cadillac, let's say you forget to plug the vacuum modulator valve's vacuum line back in, it's going to shift late and hard. Bam, bam, bam. It's not. It's going to wait until it hits. You know, and that's basically similar to what happens whenever it raises all those pressures. Well, if you, uh, the most dangerous thing you can do, one of those, uh, a lot of these vehicles have got transmission uh, throttle valve linkage hooked to the throttle. If you fool around and forget to reconnect that, then it's not going to raise the pressure and it's going to burn the transmission up. Think about it. One little mistake at the throttle body. If you leave that throttle valve cable disconnected, it'll burn the transmission up. I mean, we're talking the pressure won't go up, it'll start slipping the clutches, and next thing you know, they're coming in on the hook, and it won't pull. So make darn sure you're careful about that. What happens if that thing breaks? What if you're looking under there and you see that thing starting to fray and it looks like it's going to pop, or if it's going to come loose, or if it's got bad, you know, some kind of little bad grommet that's not holding good. If it pops off of there and that pressure doesn't go up and down with throttle, you know, it, it destroys it. And somebody's got to rebuild it or replace it. Uh, so that's, that's a really, really important thing. You know, a lot of times it doesn't even look like it's all that important, but boy, you would never believe how important it really is. Um, if the pressures are, let's see, are low at slow idle, what does that mean? Pump, pressure regulator, low fluid, or internal leakage? Pump, pressure regulator, low fluid, or internal leakage? Um, what if I'm driving, what if I'm driving and I, and I go around a, cur a corner 
and that transmission feels like it went into neutral. Oh, and boom. And then it catches whenever I straighten back up. Yeah. What if I pull my dipstick and it tells me the fluid's not low? You got the wrong dipstick. <laughs> I mean, well, that's what I'm saying. I've seen that. People will say, well, it checks to be full of fluid. Say, so add another quart of fluid anyway. And if it acts like it's supposed to, you know, you got the wrong dipstick. You got it? Now, this Mercedes transmission I got over here on the floor and so many of these other ones, they don't have dipsticks anymore. What you got to do, they got a standpipe on these Fords or on some of these Chevrolets. You got a little plug you take out with it in gear and running. And if fluid runs out, you let the fluid run out until it quits running out. Or you stick, stick your screwdriver in there and see if it's uh, going to be uh, got fluid touching it. But the long and the short of it is, you better know how to check that transmission fluid. Uh, and you got to have the temperature of the transmission exactly between the window where it's supposed to be. Because that transmission fluid is not like engine oil. Transmission fluid is extremely susceptible to expansion and contraction with temperature. Now there's a uh, transmission sitting on the floor over there, that Mercedes transmission that we put out that toilet that changed out of that uh, 2007 uh, Charger. Uh, that thing has actually got a, a dip, uh, it's got a dipstick tube, but no dipstick. And a cap on it says, you know, authorized personnel only or dealership only or whatever. And I got an $88 dipstick in there. It's got some millimeter measurements on it. And what you do, there's a little graph with the temperature where the fluid should be at each temperature. So you're looking at your scan tool and you're going to look at your transmission oil temperature. You're going to stick it in there and it should be so many millimeters deep because that dipstick goes right down there and touches the bottom of the pan. It's actually it's like just touch the bottom of the pan with a with a uh, like a, a stick with some marks on it, except it's got millimeters, 10, 20, 30, 40, 50. It's supposed to be so many millimeters per temperature. So you got to watch that, watch this, see if it lines up on your graph. I mean, that's just really there's a lot more to that than what you would think. Um, let's see, if a person is serious about becoming pressure gauge proficient, what should they do? Drive that thing around with a gauge hooked up and see how it does. Now this right here, this handout, and this is only one side, I don't know where the other side is. This right here is something you probably should memorize. It ain't very long. See that? These two pages right here. This page right here and this page right here. You should memorize these two pages because that is really good stuff. Some of the best stuff I've ever seen about pressure testing. And that's why I threw you that handout. Take that seriously and remember it. All right. Now, out there, there is a... Uh, uh, Johnny uh, over there was good enough to hook us a pressure gauge up to the um, to the Ranger, so you guys can actually see this without having to do the leg work. There's a bunch of other. Uh, I mean, he's got the gauge on there, and, and you need to be able to look at all this. Now, be careful when you put it in reverse because the pressure goes up really high. And on these, some of these, I don't know why these pressure these transmission pressure gauges are not stronger than they are. I've got one that's actually got hydraulic line hooked to it. But if the pressure goes up high enough, like when you're in the reverse and all that, it can actually bust that hose. So be careful with that. If it busts the hose, you may have a face full of transmission fluid. So wear safety glasses, okay? All right. Now then, uh, now I'm going to show you guys something yeah, else you here. You didn't tell me that when I was looking that thing up. Yeah, I know, but you needed to know it anyway. So you did not surely die. <laughs>